Let's take a minute and thank our sponsors for helping grow this podcast to bigger and better every episode. Our first one is SR3 Rescue Concepts because you don't know what you don't know. Our next one is Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. And Flippin' Coffee, brewing real coffee with real ingredients for real coffee drinkers. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help with your helicopter training, standardization, and safety checks. Or maybe just an annual FAA refresher is what you need. They're ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is amazing. With certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew members that are offering training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, and ground operations. SR3 has partnered with Petzl to assist with a personal protective equipment inspection course and the highly specific Lazard, which is used for helicopter cliff and mountain rescue. And to add into it, they also teach ground, tactical, emergency care. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Again, sr3rescueconcepts.com or follow them on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. That's sr3 underscore rescue. Then we have Life Saving Systems Corporation. Manufactures the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From their Triton harness, which is my favorite harness being a rescueman, to the rescue basket, litters, and of course the most popular hoist hook in helicopters, yes, the D-Lock. The team at LSC cuts, bends, sews, wells, and machines these products into existence every day and sends them on their way to us. We do our work so that you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out at lifesavingsystems.com. That's lifesavingsystems.com. And follow them over on Instagram, at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. That's at Rescue Gear. Next is Breeze Eastern. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and unique mission requirements has changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, operators, and those rescued has not. Contact Breeze Eastern today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. That's breeze-eastern.com. And the last one is Flippin' Coffee. At Flippin' Coffee, we roast each batch to perfection to bring that smooth, delicious cup of coffee that you won't find in most other brands. We like to keep it simple. Brewing real coffee using real ingredients for real coffee drinkers. Contact them today at FlippinCoffee.com. That's F-L-I-P-P-I-N Coffee.com. You can also follow them on Instagram at Flippin' Coffee. That's at F-L-I-P-P-I-N Coffee. As a bonus, Flippin' Coffee is given a promotion. If you punch in promotion code, all capitals, R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q, you get 10% off. That's promo code Real Rescue Capitals, all capitals, R E A L R E S Q, and you get 10%. If you're just going to send everybody an email, just make sure you tell them one thing Quinny sent me here. And thank you to all of our sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Astrid, spelled specifically with a capital A S T, to represent the aviation survival technician side of me. You see, there's a lot more to being an AST than just being a rescue swimmer. Although rescue swimmer side of the job is my favorite part, there's a lot more that we do. We have a lot more responsibilities. So I figured here at this part of the podcast, we're going to discuss the other aspects of the job. Or as the definition of asterisk, we're going to refer to these as the footnote episodes. We're going to be here discussing a lot of different things. It'll be anything between history, training, medical, whatever happens to come up. These asterisk episodes will be dropped in at random times just between all the other rescue stories. Thanks for listening and we hope you enjoy it. 
My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Hello, love. Welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. Thank you for joining me yet again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is awesome. I appreciate you being here. Um, for everybody else out there, we are going to do something called the asterisk. And the asterisk is basically the behind the scenes a little bit about some of the stuff that we do. And uh, today we are specifically going to talk about Rescue Swimmer School and the the history behind how and why the United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmers came to be. I'm excited to hear about it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I've never heard it. (laughs) No. No, you haven't. And, uh, you know, I I actually mentioned this in one of my other podcasts when I'm talking to uh, Brett Bates. Like, I actually didn't talk to you about a lot of my rescue stuff for the first five years we were together. I don't think you even brought up the Coast Guard in the first five years. And (laughs) it's been a lot longer since those first five years and you still really don't talk too too much no so this is the first time you're actually going to hear me talk about my experience Mm -hmm. in rescue swimmer school i've heard a few things but you know when brett was talking about multis i have no idea what that means so i was asking you and you said you know maybe we should talk about this so i'm excited to be here and learn a little bit more today nice well, me too. Well, again, thank you. I appreciate you you being here with me for this. So let me start with this. Um, so in 1984 is when the Rescue Swimmer program uh, came to be. And what there's a story behind it, and anybody can find this if you Google you know, the history of the Rescue Swimmer program or the history of the United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer program. Um, so, But for all intents and purposes, I'm going to go a little deeper into that and tell you my personal experience in school and how much it's changed. There's a lot of things that have changed from when we first got, the program first started, even to now. Like there, there are very big differences. Um, as far, not so much with the training itself, but how things are taught and the direction they go. You know, a lot of backstories, it was like, oh, we're just gonna run everybody into the dirt. And now there's, there's movements for specific reasons and they do things for a specific reason. Uh, they've learned. We've learned. So the the program has progressed from 1984 to now immensely, and it's amazing because. And I'll read it here in a second. But the people uh, or other agencies, other countries, are looking at the United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer program and trying to adopt a similar one. Uh, mm-hmm. I know one of my friends actually came from another country to the swimmer program just after I was in school. Uh, you know, the Advanced Rescue Swimmer School that's in Astoria, Oregon, all sorts of different agencies come to that, including the pararescues, Navy SEALs, uh, Navy Rescue Swimmers. You know, those guys, they want to go to that school. They, that is a school that everybody wants to go to because there's so much knowledge around there and they learn so much from it. But anyway, so I'm going to give you an idea as to how and why this this started. So uh, this is actually based off Coast Guard Aviation or sorry, coastguardaviationhistory.org. And you can, again, Google the how the Rescue Swimmer program came to be. So approximately 0400 on, that's 4 a.m. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday, 12 February, 1983, the marine fishing vessel, Marine Electric, sent a distress call. The vessel was taken on water and sinking off the coast of Virginia, in 20 to 40 foot seas with winds excessive of 60 knots. The Rescue Coordination Center Portsmouth alerted the Navy at NAS Oceana, that's Naval Air Station, and the Coast Guard Air Station at Elizabeth City, North Carolina, to ready the HH-3 helicopter from Coast Guard Air Station Elizabeth City. It was immediately dispatched. It was one hour, 15 minutes in route in freezing rain, but the time the helicopter arrived, the ship had sunk and 34 people are now in the water. Oh. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to recap this again. You've got 34 people in the water. It's 20 to 40 foot swells and 60 knot winds. 
It's a bad day. And it's 4 a.m. And it's 4 a.m. <laughs> yep. So the at the time, to paint the picture even more, they did not have another crew member in the aircraft. You had the two pilots and the hoist operator. And that was it. And what they would do, they would lower the, the rescue basket down and the person in the water would climb mm-hmm. into the basket and they'd hoist that up. There are still agencies that do that in this country or in the U.S. today. So when they get on scene to these guys here, the rescue basket was prepared and lowered, but numbered by severe hypothermia, the men were unable to grab the basket and pull themselves in. Mm. The Navy helicopter with a rescue swimmer was delayed because the Naval Air Station Oceana did not keep a ready crew on board the station at night, but due to the shorter in route time to the scene, the Navy H-3 helicopter arrived at the scene shortly after the Coast Guard. The Navy swimmer immediately deployed, but had difficulty with what's known as a billy pew, uh, which is a big net in the water with rough seas, and that's what the Navy would deploy to gather multiple people that would fall off the ship or multiple aviators that would go in. They would just deploy this billy pew, everybody would swim to it, get in, and then boop, they'd pull it out or long line it out, and then bring it back to the ship. Like that's, again, this was based on, okay, it's decent weather, you're not in 20 to 40 foot swells, okay? The two crews agrees to have the rescue swimmer work with the rigid basket that the Coast Guard helicopter. For an hour, both aircraft supplemented by a second HH-3 out of East City positioned themselves to re- receive rescuers. The Navy rescue swimmer sl- swam to the point of exhaustion in 40-foot seas in his effort to save as many as he could. Conditions were so severe and temperatures so cold that the seawater on his face mask froze. The number of hoists were made, but only three people were recovered alive. Mm. Tragically, a total of 31 crew members perished that day. Okay? All bad. So, you have a, a boat that goes down, that sinks off Elizabeth City, or off Virginia. 31 people die. As much as I hate to make this statement, I'm going to, Laws and rules and things happen because they're written in blood. We have a rescue swimmer that fell off a cliff and now we made changes. So now we do cliff rescues mm-hmm. differently. There are, there's a 50 mile an hour corridor in Humboldt Bay, California, because enough people have sped through that area and killed mm-hmm. other people that now there's a 50 mile an hour corridor, right? So you, you make changes based on that. So here we go. The Congressional Merchant Marine and the Fisheries Committee convened hearings to question the world's premier maritime rescue service, i.e. the U.S. Coast Guard, was unable to assist people in the water. Like, why couldn't you assist Mm -hmm. these people in the water? 40-foot seas would be one, right? So, fast forward. The rescue swimmer, an equivalent, had been used for some time in uh, the Navy. So... There was questions like uh, you, the U.S. Air Force Aerospace Rescue, uh, also known as the Pararescue Guys, so the PJs, the Air Force PJs, they've been doing this for quite some time. So I'm going to fast forward. Congress mandated the Coast Guard Authorization Act of 1984. Uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard shall use such sums as are necessary from amounts appropriated for the operational maintenance of co- of the Coast Guard to establish a helicopter rescue swimmer program for the purpose of training select Coast Guard personnel to rescue swimming skills. Puff. Mm-hmm. Helicopter rescue swimmer school was made. So in 1984 is when uh, Congress came in and said, okay, you got to do this. Then the Coast Guard said, roger that, we'll take it. And then... And what they did is they they had uh, multiple rates in the Coast Guard. The first one was, this is old school rates, and it was AM, AE, and ASM. All right, AM was Aviation Structural Mechanic. AE was the uh, av- Aviation or Aeronautical uh, Electric Mechanic. And then ASM was Aviation Survival Men. Uh, and basically what that happened when they made all these rates, ASM just kind of adopted being the rescue swimmer. So now they got to start sending people through school. So they started looking at all these schools, including the Navy Rescue Swimmer School, right? So now the Coast Guard takes all these guys, they're like, hey, come be a rescue swimmer. And 
woohoo, you're going to go swimming and save people in the water. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, this is great. Well, now they start doing like hardcore PT, which is physical training. And now they're up and they're running and cardio and getting these guys to swimmer school. All right. So now we get into swimmer school and the progression down in uh, they went down to Pensacola, Florida, and it was part of the Navy Rescue Swimmer School. Well, then the Navy killed a guy. PT them. There was a lot of issues that happened out back there, but it put the U.S. Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer School in like a holding pattern. And there was uh, my friend George Cavallo actually talks about it. There was like a hundred or something guys like in that holding pattern. And they were not allowed to go to the Navy school because the Navy was doing their investigation. Mm -hmm. So the Coast Guard came back and said, you know what? We're just going to build our own rescue swimmer school. That's what we're going to do. So the big wings in the Coast Guard get together and they said, here's the curriculum. Here's what we're going to do. Go. And they put the instructors in, in charge and said, you guys create the rescue swimmers that we need for the Coast Guard. So now... Uh, there was a transition, and then all of a sudden now the ASM school is now in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and the Coast Guard is training the rescue swimmers to get trained, all right? And then, fast forward, there's a rate change. So they basically changed the, the rates, the ratings. So instead of AM, it's now called AMT, Aviation Maintenance Technician. AE went to AET, Aviation Electronic Technician. And then ASM went to AST, which is Aviation Survival Technician. Okay, so me personally, I am an AST, and that is the current rate name, Aviation Survival Technician. Rescue Swimmer would be our secondary duty. So AST is our primary, Rescue Swimmer is our second. Now, to every swimmer out there, yes, Rescue Swimmer is number one, <laughs> and we all know this. <laughs> so does that make sense of how it all started? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so now you have all these people that died and again written in blood mm -hmm. now you have a change and that's how the change came um so you're actually going to hear guys talk in this podcast if you haven't already about like there was a push there was a hard push in the beginning of like no we don't need swimmers we don't need you guys are gear just sit in the back like man okay um a lot of the rescue swimmers actually got hoist qualified were drop master qualified, C-130 qualified. Uh, so all that happened. So whole bunch of things, like just transition, transition, transition to now, you, there's not a single helicopter that really leaves an air station without a rescue swimmer on board. Mm -hmm. You will have all four. Because they've, they've had it since where they're like, oh no, we only three, we need three guys. We're just going on a quick training flight. They get diverted. They don't have a swimmer on board. People are in the water. Right. Like, you know, they, of course. Well, because why wouldn't right. it happen like that? So, <laughs> After listening to the podcast so far, that's how they always seem to happen. <laughs> <laughs> right? There it was. Labo. We were just getting back from a medevac, and boom, we're going again. Mm -hmm. Get Labo. I love it. Any questions about any of that so far? So far, so good. All right. So now I'll, I'll bring you into my personal training at swimmer school. Um, so the first thing I did is once you get through boot camp, then you go to your first unit and you put your name on what's known as the A school list. The A school list is how you get to school. Mm -hmm. Now you have a whole bunch that you can choose from. You can go to uh, HS school, which is health service technician and be like the corpsman. You can go to FS school, which is the cooks. You can go to MK school, mechanics, or GM, gunner's mate, you know, or your aviation school, A M T A E T or AST. Well, at the time, there was about a year and a half wait for me to get to an airman program. And actually, to throw that out there, when I was in boot camp, they actually came to our class, our company and said, hey, is anybody looking to go rescue swimmer? And uh, well, actually, I should probably tell you that too. Like the first time and I wanted to be a swimmer. Well, you've, you've talked about when you went to talk to somebody about the Coast Guard, they were telling you the different jobs. Yep. The first time and I went. And they brought up the swimmer and you said, I want to do that. So I was in boot camp and they show a video, you know, guys doing jumping jacks and push ups. And then they show a guy jump out of a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it started. And then while I was there, uh, there was a swimmer that came out, out of. 
um, uh, there was a Cape May in New Jersey where boot camp is. Uh, there was a swimmer there that came over and said, hey, is anybody looking to go, a you know, ASM at the time? And I raised my hand and two other guys said, all right, let's jump in the pool. And you guys are just going to swim a 500. We're going to do a little tow. And what, what they were doing is they were building the airman program. Mm -hmm. And they needed, they needed the guys from basic training to give for the numbers. Like, oh, okay, where do these guys sit so we know where to start the training at? Like, is it going to take some guy from boot camp? 20 minutes to swim a 500 and then an old, you know, the salty in shape guy uh, from the swimmer shop that PTs all the time, they're at seven minutes. Like you can't have, you can't have an entry guy come in and be like, all right, you need to swim a seven minute 500. That's, that's not, you have to have that transition. Mm -hmm. So, but I was part of that. And I remember getting out of the pool and those guys looking at me and be like, wow, you guys, you guys swam that a lot faster than we expected. I was like, yeah, all right, wow. I mean, something. Probably screwed myself because I had to swim faster when I got to the unit. But and you weren't cool. even a swimmer growing no. up. No, I was not. That's a good point. I grew up on a lake, and all I did was swim recreation all mm -hmm. summer long, jumping off the dock, skiing behind boats, nice. jumping off the boat, yeah. <laughs> jumping out of trees. But Probably. go to the go to the coast guard, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah, it was fun. I had a good time. I had a good time growing up. I had a good time at boot camp, actually. So then what happened? You get out of the pool and they say that. Yeah, that was, that was kind of, oh yeah. So you get out of the pool and that was, that was it. And then from there, I went to my first unit, Honor Garden in DC, where I actually met up with uh, a rescue swimmer who's an amazing guy, Eric Dean. And I, I actually learned a lot from him while I was there. And he had a, he had a drive to work out, to swim, to prepare for school. Like he knew what he wanted to do. And I was still learning, um, again, 18 years old, you know, just first time on my own. Mm -hmm. Looking at this guy like, wow, okay. I'm gonna yeah, go I, jump out of a helicopter. Yeah, I can, I can do that. I, do. I don't need to like go train <laughs> like you are. And yeah, I, I, you know what? It, I should have followed Eric's lead a lot more, but he was a, he was a beast, still is a beast. Anyway, so I had trained there. Well, then I went down to my airman program in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, which was newer, you know, after my year and a half wait on the school list. Um, started my airman program. It was four months of an airman program. So you are assigned to the rescue swimmer shop and you basically shadow the rescue swimmers there. You PT with them every day. You work with them on all the survival gear. You just, you're there shadowing. So that's what I did for four months until it was my turn to go to school. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, I remember, as a matter of fact, I had a great group of guys. Um, I had my mentor, Sean Lansing. So he was there, and Sean took me under his wing. He really, really did some great things for me. Uh, Is that normal to go shadow for so many months prior to starting school? When the airman program started, yes. Prior to that, no. What about now? Now they go to an airman program. They still do. Mm. Yep. Yep. So, and it's a way to kind of get in shape before you go to school. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the kids, and I say kids because they're 18, 19, a lot of the young men and women, they when they show up to an air station, they're coming off a boat or they're coming off of, a spot where they didn't have an opportunity to really work out. So now if you throw them right into the blades and now they're just getting their butt handed to them. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's almost a little unfair, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's, it's reality, you know, and it's a good reality and it's, it, get, it comes down to a mindset and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But, um, for those guys really pushing hard, you have to have that. It's great that they have that transition of airmen. So, um, but now getting into school, school was literally the hardest thing I've ever done. And physically, mentally, there is a mindset you have to have going into it. You know, they talk about it in Navy SEAL training, that you have to, you have to embrace it. You have to own it. You know, you have to have that mindset to beat it. Pararescue, you know, I, I've got friends that are Navy SEALs. I've got friends that are pararescue men. And the swimmers are very similar in mindset. You have to have 
that mentality that I'm not going to quit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to succeed with everything they throw at you. And they throw a lot at you. And everything is timed for good reason. <laughs> if you don't make the time, you don't, you don't continue. You know, it's a way to push yourself and to push your own mindset. Um, so. Well, and they tell you to look around because some of you won't be there at the end. Yes. Yep. They do. They do. And there are guys. I remember a specifically one night pool. So we had to get in from at night. And there was, a, there was a kid that got up in the middle of the pool workout. It wasn't even a hard workout. It was just a night pool workout. And walked in the locker room. And the instructors went in there. What are you doing? He's like, I'm done. This isn't for me. And they came out. Oh, we got a drop on request. A DOR. A DOR. Yeah. All excited because somebody just quit. Just quit. Just gave it up. Just like that. Why did they get excited about that? Because they know he was never going to make it anyway. Mm. It's uh, because the program won. Because he was beat. He was beat. And I, I watched other guys wash out, quit. You know, One of the things that Sean Lansing said to me as my mentor was, if you can get out of the pool and walk to the barracks, you can do another lap. <laughs> and, and I was, if you can get up and you can walk back to the barracks, you can do another lap. And that stuck with me every single day. Yeah, it's like you can do it, not do you want to do it. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. And it was a push. It was a push every day. And every day was harder. And how long did this last? 16 weeks. So, 16 weeks? Yeah, when I was there, 16 weeks. And your first four, again, it's a little bit different now, but for me, when it, when I was first there... My first four weeks were introduction to school, uh, your basic, your in test. So you had a PT in test. You had to pass all your numbers in order just to be there. If you failed, you're immediately out. And then, uh, so you do four weeks of training. Then at the end of the four weeks, you do another PT test where the numbers are a little higher. If you don't pass that, you do not continue. Then into phase three, so you finish phase two. Once you get to phase three, now it's another PT test. If again, if you don't pass, you don't continue. And then you get to final phase, which one of the things that you asked about with uh, the podcast with Brett Bates, he mentioned he failed his multi and had to start back over. You right. Know? I was just thinking, so he finished pretty much 16 weeks. Yeah. And then had to go do 16 weeks again. Yeah. <sighs> I know, right? He really wanted it. He really wanted it. And you have to want it. Mm -hmm. And then to, to fail your final multi and get that far is, is that's a, so that's a mind job right there. And to know that you have to start back over. And he adapted and overcame it really. Like, I've got the utmost respect for Brett Bates mm -hmm. and, and his determination to get through school. It was awesome. But a multi, for your knowledge, is you basically jump out of the tower and you've got three victims in, in the pool. And you do this three different times. Well, for me, it was three different times. So you jump in. Okay, I'm going to get rescued. Person one, person two, person three. And they're doing their best. The instructors are doing their best to give you a very good scenario. We had a, I had a great scenario. Um, I jumped in. I got attacked. Came out. I won. Because you better win. Because if you don't win, you don't move on. Uh, and, then, and, and then you get your next guy and then your next guy. Uh, and then your final multi is the one where, you know, they... they give you a little bit more. So you have one with a parachute, you know, and a downed aviator and you're clearing them. And there's, there's, I mean, there's just so many different things. You have to, you're, you're tired, you're swimming hard, you're in a time limit and God forbid you go under or you're over that time limit because then you're stuck in the pool and they'll just throw you a raft and now you're swimming circles for another like four hours until literally, I kid you not, they'll just leave you there and then they'll come back and say, okay, your helicopter's back. Now you can get out of the pool. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, you have a timeline. You're on a fuel yeah. crunch. And that's reality. Fuel, you know, fuel on the aircraft is, it's not going to stay up there forever. Right. Got to get the job done. And you can't be this close to passing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As my friend Bob Watson would say, yeah, the Bering Sea don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, the mountain don't care. If you're a girl, if you're a boy, if you're black, you're white. It don't care. Mother nature does not care. 
It doesn't care if you can bench bench press 600 pounds. It doesn't matter if you can bench 35 pounds. It does not care. Yeah. You have to get the job done. And that's what we do. So, it's crazy. Yeah. Upon graduation is amazing. I loved graduation. Uh, what a, what a, I, I hope they actually still do. Yeah, achievement. All the, it was that, I remember coming out of, uh, like the end, just so pumped. Well, and not all of you made it. We had one one guy drop out of our class, and and he failed a section, so he was reverted back. Mm. He he did end up passing later, like three classes later. Um, but yeah, he it was we lost one, and at the time, there were only six people that were going through. Uh, the rescue swimmer school, Coast Guard rescue swimmer, does have a sixty percent dropout rate. So only 40% pass and actually make it. Again, mindset, got to have the mindset. Actually, one of the things you've mentioned as we're doing this podcast now is um, the classes aren't really big. There's only a handful of you in each class. Correct. Yeah, the first one was, it used to be six. And then when I went through, our class was the first class of eight. And we were the largest class to graduate to date with seven. Mm. Um, and they were not expecting that. As a matter of fact, when we got into the middle of the second phase, one of the instructors came back and said, yeah, we needed to get some more sewing machines, which I'll touch on that in a sec, <laughs> because we didn't think you guys were going to make it this this far. With the 60% dropout rate, mm-hmm. you figure you're losing basically three people out mm-hmm. of that class, and they were going to be down to five anyway, which is would have been a normal class. But we proved them wrong, so... As that little side note, yes, every one of us rescue swimmers are seamsters. We can sew. We get on a sewing machine and we can tear that up. <laughs> That's one thing I definitely learned about you early on because you can sew stuff. I can. And I cannot. Yes. <laughs> so I can take all your dresses in here. Yep. yep. Uh, Thank I can you, sir. fix them. Thank Some you. of the guys actually, when they retire, they actually get into sewing uh, boat covers and cushions and canvases. You know, a lot of our stuff is big stuff. But yes. In Rescue Swimmer School, we are seamsters. That's awesome. <laughs> Fun fact. So, um, once you graduate, you're not actually done. After that, you continue on to EMT school. So, we all become EMT basics. And then from there, we, uh, while we're at our air station, our first unit, getting qualified and getting qualified, you go through all of your checks. You have to do your, um, what's known as a pre fight, post flight. Your post-flight letter is what it's called, and that's learning the aircraft that you're going to be flying on. I was in Kodiak, so I had to learn the 60, and then I got qualified uh, as a basic air crewman on the C-130, and then I needed to be familiar with the 65. So I needed to kind of learn. I needed to learn the 60, learn the 130, or the C-130, which is an airplane, four props, huge, uh, and then I needed to learn the 65. So that was a big deal. And then you go to Advanced Rescue Swimmer School, which is in Cape Disappointment. Or Cape what? Cape Disappointment. <laughs> yeah. It is the Columbia River Barge okay. down in Astoria, Oregon. Uh, it is amazing. And that school is awesome. You learn where you get technique into big surf. And we do a surf swim out of the right off the beach. We get into the big waves right into the breaks in the, in the inlet. We get on the cliff. You're learning cliff rescue, cave rescue. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you learn. And you get more into wildlife, like how to kelp. Like what happens if you get into that, and and so on and so forth. So it's a really good learning experience there. So you just take your, you take everything to the next level at that point, and it is it's pretty awesome to do. So. That's Rescue Swimmer School. Mm-hmm. Would have been nice to have known you during that time. I was. Or, or not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I'm, no, it's good. It's good. I'm glad we waited. So. Yeah. Hey, it worked out in the movie. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I know, the they, only, they guardian. The, yeah, the only knowledge I have of the Rescue Swimmer School prior to you was the Guardian. That's right. Yeah. Convenient enough, I'm married to a teacher. Mm-hmm. Just like the movie. Yeah. I know. Thanks, Ashton Kutcher. Good job. <laughs> I think his name was Fisher. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Wasn't Ashton. Fisher. Good yes. job, Fisher. Yeah. You scored that one. Yeah, dating the teacher. You just married one. 
So our worlds are very different when we mm-hmm. when we come home from work at night. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. <laughs> so do you have any other questions? So you went to you started the summer school. You were there for the four months. And then you started a school, and then you talked about EMT school and the advanced school. So mm-hmm. how long was the whole process? The whole process took me about a year and a half to two years to become a fully qualified rescue swimmer, standing duty on my own, ready to go. And you made a comment, I don't want to call it a joke because it's not a joke, but you know, the Bering Sea don't care. Well, that's where you got sent right away. (laughs) So (laughs) after your year and a half, two years, were you prepared for the Bering Sea? Absolutely. With all of my training that A school provided, all the training that my mentors in the swimmer shop provided in both Elizabeth City and in Kodiak, um, advanced swimmer school, EMT school, absolutely. I feel 100%. Like it was, I was ready to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when, when, and they, they don't just cut you loose to cut you loose. I mean, you've gone through multiple mm-hmm. steps, multiple flights. You know, you've got an value with you every single time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the greatest part about it is not only are you being evaluated, you're being given tips and tricks on the way. Kurt Revels was a great mentor for me up in Kodiak. Uh, Dave Toppy was another one that took me out, you know, my first couple of checks. Jason Bunch, uh, John Hall, Tim Adams, Tim McGee. I, I could name them all. Everybody mm-hmm. gave me a little piece of something that I took with me to the next level mm-hmm. and continued my, my venture forward. So I, I, yeah, 100% I was ready to go. And I will say this, um, every one of us and all the names I just mentioned, we're all qualified. E- everybody's qualified to do this job. Like we've all gone through this process. Everybody's checked off. It's really the luck of the draw as to, or unluck of the draw, depending on how you want to look at it, mm-hmm. as to when the SAR alarm goes off, who's on duty? So who is there when the alarm goes off? We all have the opportunity. Everybody's qualified. It's just your day. Mm -hmm. And that's the day that somebody else is having a bad day. And that bad day is kind of our good day. It's like, I get to go to work. I get to do what I've been training to do or what I've trained to do. And what you like to do. And what I love to do. (laughs) And I like that you get to do what you love to do. But hearing some of these stories... (laughs) that your friends have talked about on this podcast so far (laughs) being your wife (laughs) i wouldn't mind it not being you on duty but yeah 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 Uh i know you can do it i can yeah i I, i've i've been around you where you're trying to teach me how to read the waves and read the current (laughs) you know how to do that yeah lots of good training Mm -hmm. you know i you know, you're saying that, you know, the, the days the alarms don't go off, my friend Bob Therese, would always tell me, like, if the alarm didn't go off, that means everybody was safe that mm-hmm. night. That means nobody had any problems that night. And that's actually, that should be a great feeling. Mm-hmm. Nobody had issues that night. But the day they I have issues. It was issue, always like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's... I appreciate you talking to me. Yeah. You know, it's always fun to learn more because there's so much more to this. There's so many backstories and things that we don't know about. And y'all are so humble that nobody really talks about their stuff. Thank you. I, I, I will agree with you. Mm-hmm. There are very few of us that actually are willing to talk. And mm-hmm. it's like pulling teeth to all my boys out there <laughs> to tell me a couple stories. And this is, I, I appreciate you listening and wanting to do this with me. Yeah. So, um, Well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Until next time. Actually, let me tell you one more story. All right. So, swimmer school. So, we get up, we're doing a run. And the run, it was a... I don't know what you're going to tell, tell me right now, but I do remember the time you told me you passed out in the pool. So, I better get to oh, that story, man. too. <laughs> you know what? I'll give you that story, too. Let's start with the running one. So let's go with the running one. So now we've got all the classes. Actually, I think it was just two classes because we were waiting for the baby class to come in off the top of my head. Anyway, they 
our instructors decided that day was a day for punishment. And I don't know what we were being punished for, but it was all I know is we ran. We ran and we did push ups and burpees and sugar cookies and all the sugar. I'm sorry, sugar cookies. It's when you get all wet and then you roll around in the sand uh, and then keep going. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> and we would do the sprint from the from the edge of the beach from like the top of the beach by the parking lot area where there was a fence down to the water touch the water and run back up and you'd have to stand at attention they're known as this pop tall stand at attention after you did your sprint down to the water and back and i remember after like i don't know seven or eight and maybe i'm exaggerating but i don't think so my boy Paul standing next to me, it pops to attention and goes straight back. Whoosh! <laughs> my boy passed out. <laughs> next thing I know, we're all standing at attention. The instructors are attending to him. They call the uh, the local clinic, you know, because we had a clinic on base, HS. They pick him up the ambulance and we continue to run. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of my stories. Oh, gosh. Yes, we had come back for me when I, so in my, while I was going through school, we ended up going to school over the holidays for Christmas, New Year's, and whatnot. So we had like a holiday break or we went into holiday routine. Well, we continued to PT like even while we're out of school. But as you're very familiar with, when you don't work out like hard for two weeks and you mm. come back, you get your butt kicked. Yeah. Well, I was in the pool and we were getting smoked and it was just one of those days. It was just like, hey, you know, they're just going to put your mind to the test. They're going to put your body to the max. And I remember we <laughs> I was never last in in swimming in our in our seven guys. I was never last. I was I was very I was probably never first. Actually, I won't even give you that. I was never first, but I was never last. And today, I was last. And I remember doing sprints. I remember doing underwaters. And underwaters is 25 meters or 25 yards down. You pop and you swim back or swim down and then underwater back. And whatever we were doing for the workout, we're just getting hammered, right? And it's coming down to the end. And the, the instructors say, all right, first guy back can get out of the pool and go to the locker room. And I'm like, hallelujah, it's coming to an end. I'm, free. I'm winning this one. I'm going to win with everything I can. I, everything I've got. Boom, we take off. I down back. I'm last. Oh, damn it. They call the guy out. Yeah, hey, so-and-so, get out of the pool. He gets out. Go. We swim down and back. Now, my dude, there's seven of us. And we're doing 50-meter or 50-yard sprints. And it's on the clock, too. Because you, if, you be, if you're slower than the clock, you got to do it again anyway. Ugh. So, boom, down and back. All right, so-and-so, get out. Boom, so-and-so, get out. Boom, so-and-so, get out. Sprint, so-and-so, get out. Finally, I'm the last guy in the pool. And they're like, Quinn, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, Nothing! Nothing can hurt me! <laughs> like, Quinn, can you go again? Yes, yes, I can go again. Now, unbeknownst to me, I actually, none of the words were actually coming out. I was all mumble jumble. They ended up checking my pulse. My pulse was freaking through the roof. They pulled me out of the pool. I threw up all over the side of the pool deck. And next thing I know, I'm getting a ride to the clinic and docs. They're kicking me with IVs and... Well, that's one of those situations, oh, apparently, where you can't do one more lap. So it was time to call it a day. If they had said do one more lap, I would have done one more lap. Come yeah. on, baby. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that was fun. That was and, fun. you know, n yeah, not everybody can do what you've just described. No. I have no desire to ever try. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people would agree. Hey, I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. You're oh. absolutely correct. Yeah. There are a lot of people that can't do this. No. And that's okay. That's okay. That's why you have guys like me. And, you right. got and guys. I wouldn't want them coming to save me if I was trapped. I'd want someone like you. <laughs> Come get me. <laughs> <laughs> Happily. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks, son. Absolutely. Hey, thank you for listening. So, this portion of the asterisk, the behind the scenes, the inside information. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, next time we'll have to come up with another topic. I like it. In the meantime, keep on listening to the Real Rescue Podcast. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute and as my daughters like to tell me all the time, 
like and subscribe oh yeah i appreciate it so i'm pulling chocks and taking off but before i go if anyone out there has a rescue story and would be willing to share it i would be humbled and honored to have you as a guest or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else here that we talk about please send me an email at therealrescue at gmail.com that's T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q at gmail.com. Or you can also check us out on our Instagram page at The Real Rescue. And that's at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. And for all of you standing on the watch today, remember when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, stay safe out there, everybody.